Halloween is almost here again, and that means as Christians we have to ask ourselves again, is it just a day of harmless fun for the kids, or is it supernatural propaganda from the principalities and powers that the Apostle Paul warned us about? In ancient Britain and Ireland, the Celtic festival of Samhain Eve was observed on October 31st, at the end of summer. It was an occasion for one of the ancient fire festivals when huge bonfires were set on hill, hilltops to frighten away evil spirits. The souls of the dead were thought to revisit their homes on this day, and the autumn festival acquired sinister significance with ghosts, witches, hobgoblins, black cats, fairies, and demons of all kinds said to be roaming about. In addition, Halloween was thought to be the most favorable time for divinations concerning marriage, luck, health, and death. So right away, if I did not tell you this was the festival of Samhain, you would automatically be thinking Halloween because this describes it to a T and we haven't even gotten started yet. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue. Samhain, one of the most important and sinister calendar festivals of the Celtic year, held on November 1st, so it's October 31st uh, to November 1st, the world of the gods was believed to be made visible to mankind. And the gods played many tricks on their mortal worshipers. It was a time fraught with danger, charged with fear, and full of supernatural episodes. Sacrifices and propitiations of every kind were thought to be vital, for without them the Celts believed they would not prevail over the perils of the season or counteract the activities of the deities. Samhain was an important precursor to Halloween. So ladies and gentlemen, we see right off the bat that the actual origin of Halloween had nothing to do with All Hallows' Eve that we're going to see uh, evolved into, from the Catholic Church, that its roots go all the way back into a pagan cultic festival called Samhain where they believed that the curtain or the veil between earth and the second dimension of the demons of the demonic realm or the place of the dead was thinned. And at that place on October 31st and November 1st, the veil was thinned and that allowed spirits of the dead to transfer from the place in the abode of the dead into the place of the living. And because of that, uh, there were many supernatural things that happened uh, during those time periods. And so a lot of cultural traditions developed to counter what they called, uh, some of them, the gods. Okay, Today, even in Satanism, the High Holy Day, guess when it is? October 31st. Where do you think they get that from? Is it made up? They too believe. The Wiccans believe. The actual pagan religion, the pagans believe. They'll even tell you on their own websites that you, I saw this quote, it said, Christians, comma, you can thank us for Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. So first of all, in the history timeline, from the Celts, they celebrated this festival called Samhain, and then along came the Romans. And the Romans took over the Celts. After conquering the Irish and the Celts in the first century, Samhain began to get mixed with two other Roman feasts for the dead, because the Romans had their own feasts for the dead. Those were called Pomona Day and Feralia. So Pomona Day and Feralia, two feasts, that were integrated into Samhain. How many know that every time a country takes over another country, there's a mixture of traditions, okay? What is the best expression of that here in the United States? Everything we do. The United States is a melting pot, is it not? Okay, there is all kinds of traditions that are, 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 are melt in a, in a culture that gets mixed with another culture. And that's exactly what happened when the Romans took over the Celts in the first century is that the Samhain festival, the Romans now are living amongst the Celts, the Celts are living amongst the Romans, and there was a mixture of, hey, that's kind of cool in your holiday, let's mix that in here, and that's pretty neat, you guys do that, let's do this. And then those holidays began to merge. So I'm gonna show you some of the things and how they merged on the timeline. For instance, Feralia was held on February 21st and was the day to honor the dead. But like other Roman holidays, it was completely filled with drunkenness, orgies, fornication, all kinds of crazy stuff. 
Pomona Day, on the other hand, was November 1st. This was a day to honor the goddess Pomona, who's the goddess of trees, fertility, and fruits. And you know what her sacred symbol was? None other than the apple. Next comes along the Catholic Church. Just a few hundred short years later, we've got this. Having multiple days for remembering the dead saints and martyrs, the Catholic Church agreed that there should be one day for all of the saints. And so what was happening in Catholicism is that uh, a martyr, or what they would can be considered a saint, and you were automatically a saint if you were martyred, and that's how they began. So when you became a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, they believed in remembering your death and, and, and honoring you in your death. Now what their historians will tell you in Catholicism is that All Saints Day was born right here in 609 AD, had nothing to do with paganism, and it had to do with the, the, uh, uh, the christening, if you will, of the Pantheon to be a church and to remember all of the martyrs in All Saints Day. So the Catholic Church's agenda throughout the centuries was to take the pagan holidays and begin to take them over. So Pope Gregory III moved All Saints Day to November 1st to dedicate the new All Saints Chapel, makes sense, in St. Peter's Rome, at the same time making an effort to Christianize the pagan feast of the same name. So let me ask a question. Would we all agree that the pagan feast Samhain festival, which was a pagan feast of the dead, is not from God? As with the festival of Samhain, the Catholic believers celebrated with huge bonfires, parades, and costumes masquerading as dead saints, angels, and demons. Altogether, All Saints Eve, October 31st, All Saints Day, November 1st, and All Souls Day, November 2nd, combined into what was called Hollow Mass, or Holy Mass, imitating to the T the Celtic Feast of Solomon. These people that were alive at this time that are celebrating in costumes, masquerading as dead spirits, demons, dead saints, bonfires, and all these things were literally imitating the very Celtic pagan demonic feast from a thousand years earlier and they didn't even know. I submit to you today that we're doing the exact same thing. Call it what you want. Do it however you want. If an ancient Celt showed up today, he'd feel right at home. From All Saints Day to Halloween, how did that jump happen? In 1556, the Scottish term All Hallows Eve began to be used. So in 1500s is when we see the first term all Hallows Eve. When the phrase was used in the English language of the West in 1745, it was pronounced Halloween. That's where it comes from. So Halloween comes from All Hallows Eve, which means Holy Evening. All Saints Day is, is a commemoration where they pray to the dead saints. And the dead saints intercede for them. Even though my Bible tells me when you're dead, you're dead. There is no interceding for the living from the people of the dead. Let's look into Hebrews chapter 9 and talk about praying for the dead. Verse 27, it says, And as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Once to die, then judgment. There is nothing in between of an opportunity to go from death, eternal death, to eternal life once you're dead. Once you're dead, it's over with. Your judgment is sealed. Psalms 115, 17 says, The dead praise not Yahweh, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore, praise the Lord. The dead can't praise the Lord. Think about this. So if they can't praise the Lord because they're dead, how do they pray for you? Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, for the, for the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Why don't they know anything? Because they're waiting for the resurrection. Why? It's judgment. Necromancy. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10, it says, There shall not be found among you 
Anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens or is a sorcerer. Listen to this. Or one who conquers spells or a medium or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, or calls upon the dead. Why am I going through all this? Because I'm trying to put some weight and gravity on this holiday's reality of what it means to the ones who made it. This is what they believe. When you celebrate Halloween, you are engaging in a belief system of necromancy. You are engaging in a belief system of calling upon the dead. This is no Christian holiday, my friends, in origin. If it was, we wouldn't find it in every culture on earth. The Mexican Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos, it goes back to the ancient festival of the dead, celebrated by the Aztecs. The Aztecs were had a day of the dead. Guatemala, this is where Guatemala's day of the dead comes from as well. Listen to this, Brazil, China, Japan, Guatemala, Vietnam, Nepal, Philippines, and many, many more, too many to list, dozens, all have a day of the dead. This day of the dead goes all the way back to ancient Babel, to Nimrod. And when God sent the angels down to confound the languages, it is the only conceivable theory of how all of these cultures around the world could have the same day of the dead on the same day, most of them. It's incredible, as I research this, to discover that many of these, most of these, have the same day, the day of the dead. And there's no way, because they're on completely different sides of the earth, that one could have ever talked to the other. The only conceivable theory is the Tower of Babel. So let's go into the origin of holiday traditions and really begin to zoom in here. The Oxford American College Dictionary says this about bonfires. I thought this was interesting. Late Middle English, it's from bone fires. The term originally denoted a large open air fire on which bones were burned, sometimes as part of a celebration. Saw one. Also, one for burning heretics or prescribed literature. And so what would happen during the Samhain festivals, they would do these bone fires where they would make human sacrifices and animal sacrifices. They would take the bones of those animals and those humans, and that is where we get the term bonfire from. Now, most of you know of Stonehenge, and if you actually see many Stonehenges around the world, we all know of the one infamous Stonehenge, but lots of towns actually have small replicas of this built. Now this is where the Druids would go and they would worship their quote unquote stag god on the occultic holiday such as Halloween and All Hallows Eve. They performed sacrifices at these sites. Ritual, barbaric sacrifices, many of them are too graphic for me to speak of, but the sacrifices are known to involve the draining of blood and the taking out of organs from these people they sacrifice and even the eating of the heart. Now, Druids would gather at Stonehenge on Samhain with gourds and pumpkins. So that's where the tie-in comes from, the gourds and pumpkins, which they used to call corpse candles. And they would fill them with human fat taken from previous sacrifices given to the gods. They'd also bring cauldrons and light them on fire as well, warming them up for the sacrificial ceremony that they would be performing. Now, the trick-or-treat and the knocking on the door and for trick or treat. Now, there's multiple meanings behind it. But what the Druids would do is they would bang on the doors of local people and they would yell trick or treat to see if the Lord of the home or the Lord of the manor would provide a treat. A treat would be one of the servants of the household to be given up for sacrifice on that night. Yes, this is how sick it is. The reward for the treat would be one of the pumpkins filled with human fat and they would light it so that everyone within the house was protected from the demons that they were summoning on Samhain. If you didn't give up an offering, you would get a six-pointed star inside of a circle, a hexagram painted with blood on your front door. 
This would be an attractive force for the demons and the people inside would be plagued with the demonic curse during this period. Another theory is that people would leave treats of food and candies outside for the demonic spirits as they traveled the material world on Halloween day, October 31st. The treats would keep the evil spirits at bay from plaguing the household. The Wicker Man. Now I talked about the festival, the Burning Man festival that goes out and goes on out in the desert where they burn this giant Wicker Man. If you ever seen the movie The Wicker Man, if you're old enough to watch it or see it, this is actually what they did. They would put, offer human sacrifices inside of this giant Wicker Man and they would burn it and it would be a sacrifice to the gods. And the ceremony you see at the Burning Man is the exact same ceremony. It's a copy of it, even though people go there, they're oblivious to what's going on and people think it's some type of artistic expression. Now, another one of the traditions on Halloween is dressing up in costumes. It used to be called guising. This came about because the veil between the spiritual world and physical world is its thinnest, like I said earlier, and the departed souls can come visit their loved ones they believe during this period. The lit flames in the sacrificial areas are a beacon for the spirits to find and enter into our world. They believe this could filter out the evil spirits by dressing up in costumes that they could scare away evil spirits. So the Druid priests would wear scary clothing to keep them away. It just goes to show you that a frog put in a boiling pot will jump out, but you put a frog in a cold water and turn the heat up, stay in there until he dies. And that's where we're at in America. Christianity has got to the place where we don't even see it. We're that oblivious to evil that we're actually okay with dressing up our children as demons, fairies, ghosts, goblins, and avengers. And so for the witches or um, anyone who identifies with them in, in any way with being a witch, the way that they see Halloween is basically as a sacred and holy night where um, you pay tribute to all your dead ancestors or all the dead that have passed on before you. And death is not something to be feared. So it's a celebration. It's a night of celebration. And death means basically you're passing into another world. So instead of the physical realm, you're going into another world, a spiritual type of world only. They say that the veil between the worlds is at its thinnest on that one night. Therefore, you have access into that spiritual realm. You have access to communicate with the dead. So some people also do that. The truth is the veil is the thinnest on that world. And the reason being that it is the thinnest is because the amount of witchcraft working towards making that happen is at its absolute peak on Halloween night, October 31st. When you celebrate Halloween, you have now made an agreement with Halloween. Halloween is a satanic ritual holiday. I don't mean to be flippant about this, but this is one of those issues where if we take the Bible seriously, and this is the word of God after all, we may have to make some changes about the type of entertainment that we enjoy or even the way that we pray. And it may require some uncomfortable conversations with our children. See, it's our job to train them up in the way they should go. And that includes teaching them about God's very clear warnings about witchcraft. I am writing this urgent message because I was once a witch. I lived by the stars as an astrologer and numerologist, casting horoscopes and spells. I lived in the mysterious and shadowy realm of the occult. By means of spells and magic, I was able to invoke the powers of the controlling unknown and fly upon the night winds, transcending the astral plane. Halloween was my favorite time of year, and I was intrigued and absorbed in the realm of Wiccan witchcraft. All this was happening in the decade of the 60s, when witchcraft was just starting to come out of the broom closet. It was during that decade of the 60s, in the year of 66, that a woman named J.K. Rowling was born. This is the woman who has captivated the world in the year of 2000 with four books known as the Harry Potter series. These books are orientational and instructional manuals of witchcraft woven into the format of entertainment. These four books by J.K. Rowling teach witchcraft. I know this because I was once very much a part of that world. 
Witchcraft was very different in the 60s. There were a lot fewer witches, and the craft was far more secretive. At the end of that spiritually troubled decade, I was miraculously saved by the power of Jesus Christ and His saving blood. I was also delivered from every evil spirit that lived in me, and I was set free. However, as I began to attend fundamental Christian churches, I realized that even there witchcraft had left its mark. Pagan holidays and Sabbaths were celebrated as Christian holidays. As time went on, I watched the so-called Christian churches compromising and unifying. I also watched with amazement as teachings from Eastern religions and New Age doctrine began to captivate congregations. It was a satanic setup and I saw it coming. Illuministic conspirators were bringing forth a one-world religion with a cleverly concealed element of occultism interwoven in its teachings. In order to succeed in bringing witchcraft to the world and thus complete satanic control, an entire generation would have to be induced and taught to think like witches, talk like witches, dress like witches, and act like witches. The occult songs of the 60s launched the Luciferian project of capturing the minds of an entire generation. In the song Sound of Silence by Paul Simon and Garfunkel, we were told of seeds that were left while an entire generation was sleeping, and that the vision that was planted in my brain still remains. Now it is the year 2000. All of the foundations for occultism and witchcraft are in place. The Illuminists have to move quickly because time is running out. It was the communist revolutionary Lenin who said, Give me one generation of youth and I will transform the entire world. Now, an entire generation of youth has been given to a woman named J.K. Rowling and her four books on witchcraft, known as the Harry Potter series. As a former witch, I can speak with authority when I say I have examined the works of Rowling and that the Harry Potter books are training manuals for the occult. Untold millions of young people are being taught to think, dress, speak, and act like witches by filling their heads with the contents of these books. Children are so obsessed with these Harry Potter books, they have left television and video games to read these witchcraft manuals. Witchcraft is a very broad concept that differs between cultures, but in simple terms, it's the practice of performing some physical act, a ritual, speaking a set of words, or inscribing a rune or sigil on an object to achieve a desired supernatural result, magic. And no wonder it's been with humanity since the beginning. I mean, who wouldn't want to wave a wand or speak a few words and get exactly what you want? And it makes for good entertainment, from Bewitched to American Horror Story, from Harry Potter to Frozen, from The Wizard of Oz to Maleficent. Stories about witches and magic always have an audience. How did humanity learn the art of witchcraft? The Book of Enoch suggests that the Watchers who rebelled against Yahweh, the group of 200 who descended upon Mount Hermon, were responsible. Whether that's literally true or not, Enoch does document for us the belief among Jews during Old Testament times that the practice of casting spells did not originate with God. Obviously, there are other monsters, myths, legends that I could have included as part of the report on Halloween. Uh, mummies, zombies, uh, Frankenstein's monster. It's not for me to tell you how to handle Halloween in your home. You know already, if you've got young children, that you've got a difficult choice to make as a Christian. Is this something that we should celebrate? Just wanted to present you with some information that you can use while you make up your mind.